it's called this in section A. It's in condition either to the school field. Yeah. Y'all ready to get going? Good morning. How are you this morning? Uh, good morning. Um, I'm, we're going to call this meeting to order. Our workshop this morning here, and we've got our transportation director and um, chief of operations with us this morning. Um, Dr. Tell me your name, Rouse. Rouse. Okay. I always want to say something different there. And um, let me find my agenda here. They gave it to me last night. Pulled it out of the binder. I don't have my agenda, but do you have your agenda, Mr. Okay. All right, you guys are first up on deck. We just, that was it. We don't um, normally do the pledge during our um, workshop. And so I'm going to turn the presentation over to you two. And um, you can tell me how you want to receive questions. Do you want us to wait until the end, or would you like for us to? ask our questions as they proceed or tell me tell me which would be more efficient for you or we kind of wait to a stopping point at each section or what if, if you don't mind we can wait till the end all right sounds good sounds good can you hear me okay? and I can and I'm gonna ask if the um, the folks in the booth upstairs there could we get another mic downstairs excuse me or you want to get that one right there um, so you'll have that one so mr. Stanley they, you, they're gonna um, use that one you can just put that one and you can turn it off Mr. Stanley and put that one in the blank spot there so they'll have one I think that'll be more efficient there all right thank you all so go ahead good morning board chair board members superintendent Andrew and administrators we appreciate this opportunity to present this workshop on transportation and tell you about the steps that we're going to take to solve the ongoing issues in transportation it's our goal to ensure students are safely in their seats every day ready to learn. It's important to recognize that the transportation team is a group of very hardworking individuals that care deeply about our students. I have witnessed in my short uh, couple of months in my new position as chief of operations the dedication and caring that each of them possesses. I want to take this opportunity to thank each of them for their commitment to the department and acknowledge that we are all here to help make sure that we are successful in the transportation department and making sure it's efficient and effective. We're going to present to you today the steps that are necessary to ensure that we make changes that will ensure that students are transported to school in time for breakfast so that we are ready, they are ready to go to class nourished and ready to learn every day. We are all aware of the concerns in transportation and we are not going to be able to be successful without making these changes. So um, I'd like to begin by reviewing the board policy 5120.03 regarding the district's responsibility for transportation of students. The policy states, the board provides transportation to students with choice assignments when it is required by law. The board also may provide transportation for other choice assignments as provided for in this policy. In addition, if space is available on, a, on an existing route, the superintendent may authorize a student with a choice assignment to receive transportation. However, no new stops will be created to accommodate the request and the superintendent may revoke the authorization for transportation at any time for any reason. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Rawls, who will discuss the challenges we are facing. He will give some statistics and solutions of current and future data that we know will be the solutions that will have ha that will be needed for trans that have been needed for transportation for so very long. And now Dr. Rawls, the director of transportation, who I am so very excited and happy to introduce and grateful that he has come here in Alachua County to be with us in the transportation department. Next slide. Thank you. Um, good morning, um, board chair, board members, and um, Superintendent Andrew in your respective places. 
Um, we will jump right into our transportation challenges. Um, we want to discuss some of the um, hiccups that we're currently enduring in our current system. And we want to talk about how we're going to um, redirect or recorrect some of those challenges and move forward, um, as Ms. Eunice stated at the beginning of the presentation, with a more efficient system for our students. Um, a couple of those challenges um, include the um, Magnet and Choice program, um, our courtesy ridership program as it is today. Um, I, we also want to look at a venture to evaluate our current school start times. Um, we want to look at a district-wide route optimization um, internally in our transportation department to ensure that we are operating most efficiently with our route. Um, and as last, as we all know, is, which is a big one um, across the nation with the national driver shortage, is um, looking at opportunities for recruitment and retention and trying to figure out how we can um, get ahead of that. Our current operating framework is made up of 100%. Um, the board allocation is about 34% to support the current transportation program. Typically across the state, there's about a 50% match. Um, and then that 50% match begins to change based off of the programs and additional services that your district will offer. Um, currently, our um, budgetary breakup is about 34% um, percent coming from board to support our students who are two miles or more riders. Um, we currently get about 34.2% from the state FESP uh, reimbursement for student ridership, and that is for our students who are two miles or more or um, warrant or require special needs transportation. Um, 15% is our courtesy ridership program, which is being um, supported and paid fully by our board. Um, and then um, our magnet and choice program is about 15% as well, which is being s fully supported by the board. Um, that's given the board a financial responsibility of the transportation makeup of about 67%. Our next slide, we want to take a look at our expenses versus our revenue. Um, if you will notice the gold bar on your presentation that is indicated FESP plus e ESE is our state allocation base that we receive from the Department of Education to transport our students um, who are two miles or more or um, our special need population. The black bars are the bars that are supported fully by the board. And I think that those numbers and percentages directly represent our um, bus utilization. And so the issue that we're running into currently, board, is that we are currently overutilizing our resources, which is constantly putting us in a position where we are dealing with late buses, we have buses on the ground, um, buses where we have to split and cover or do double backs and sometimes triple backs. Um, which is a direct impact or effect on our daily operations and getting our students to and from. Um, we are constantly in a position where we are having to notify parents of 90-minute bus delays. Um, and with our bus utilization, currently we're utilizing about 16 buses to our courtesy ridership program, um, and that is supporting about 1,100 kids. Our choice and magnet is using somewhere around 26 buses supporting about 1,600 kids. And then our students outside of two miles, including our ESE, is about 4,600 students. We currently are overextended in our services. And so this presentation, um, as we move forward to kind of redirect or recorrect some of that and reevaluate our current situation to um, ensure that students are on time to schools, um, to ensure that we can 
um, get around some of our traffic flows and our current traffic infrastructures and to ensure that we maximize the use and cost of our um, resources and fleet. Um, currently, our um, cost to transport a student is about $1,600. Um, we want to lower that cost by making sure that we can maximize our resources and utilize the um, equipment as efficiently as possible, ensuring that all of our students who are transportation eligible and um, need transportation services can get a equitable and fair on time arrival to and from school. To do some of those things, we have provided a potential um, operating structure. And in that potential operating structure, it um, would require us to eliminate our current courtesy ridership program as it stands today. However, we will replace that with a habitus walking program, which is absolutely funded through the state. And so in our areas and populations where our students absolutely has a hazardous walk to school as defined by state statute, we will warrant and supply transportation. Um, to remove the courtesy portion, because it absolutely is what it is. It is absolutely a courtesy that is un unfunded by the district. And we absolutely have to put in resources to um, supply and support those courtesies. Another potential operation, operational structure um, is reducing our current magnet stops as they stand today. Um, we would like to, we are, we are going to evaluate our current program and ensure that all of our students who need magnet transportation will still have access to magnet transportation. However, it will be on a reduced scale. And so we want to look at or evaluate um, hub stops in general and respective locations so that all students have accessibility to utilize those stops. Um, what that will do for our current structure is allow us to maximize the use of tiers of routes. When you have magnet transportation and they have to travel from one end of the county to the other end of the county, the only thing that can combat time and distance is additional resources. Additional resources for us putting another bus on the road to combat that time and distance as well as the traffic infrastructure that we currently have in our county. Um, to put another bus on the road is about $108,000 a year. And that encompasses everything from fuel, wear and tear, um, maintenance, as well as driver and aid salary if required. Um, and so looking at um, this reduction for magnet, we will still absolutely provide our magnet transportation. However, we will do that at a reduced scale and make sure that we can implement hub stops so that all kids have a equal. The um, optimal transportation contributions as we polled some districts um, around our, our state and some districts that were similar in size of us, we find that it is about a 50-50 split. Um, we are currently um, around a 67-68 um, split uh, and 68-32 uh, split. And so we kind of want to look at optimizing that so we can get back to where we need to be on that 50-50 split or even uh, more efficient on that scale. So now we'll move into some recommended solutions to some of those challenges that we are having in our current transportation system. Um, our first solution is to address our choice and magnet programs. As mentioned earlier, um, we will evaluate a system that reduces our current stops to uh, one to two hub stops per school zone. Again, giving each student that opportunity if they decide that magnet is the route that they would like to pursue in our education system, we will absolutely provide those one to two hub stops per zone for, for those students to take advantage of. Um, our courtesy program. 
we want to move to eliminating the current courtesy ridership program as it stands today and then look and then implement our hazardous walking program, which is absolutely supported by the state. It is absolutely a part of um, state statute and it tells us how to manage and direct that program. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward in the presentation. Um, the next part of this um, system evaluation would be our school start times. We um, will develop a committee to um, look at our school start times across the district. Um, we currently uh, want to move and build into a efficient three-tier system. And so a three-tier transportation system, depending on the size of your district, can range. Um, they have been from 45 minutes to an hour and 10. And so that is an hour and 10 minutes, for example, between your middle schools, elementary, and high school so that you can maximize the use of your resources. Um, allowing that bus to transport max somewhere around 155 students total. So between the three tiers, elementary, middle, and high, you can get about 155 students on that bus and maximize the resource. Also increasing your ABO, your average, average bus occupancy. Currently, with some of our courtesy ridership programs and our magnet programs, we are not able to maximize average bus occupancy and that cost per student increases from $1,600 to, um, in some cases, we've evaluated based off of the number of students in that tier that that bus is running to four or $5,000 per student. So by looking at reducing some of those hub stops and maximizing the use of them, that cost per student absolutely goes down. Um, we, with the school start times in the three-tier bell system, we will also consider House Bill 733, um, which is coming online in about two years with um, school start times for our high schools um, standardized as well as our middle schools. So we will definitely look at a system that encompass that so we can be prepared for that transition. Um, also, school start times in your high populated areas is a direct impact for traffic school buses have to sit in traffic so we kind of want to look at mitigating that and and working with that team to see where we can reduce traffic patterns and traffic flows or if we can move before the rush hour traffic or even after the rush hour traffic so those are a um, couple of things that are on the table with that With the choice and magnet, revamping the current system, transporting um, the 1,600 kids, we absolutely will still transport our 1,600 kids by creating our hub stops to increase our efficiency on our resources and reduce the number of buses needed to transport those students, which allows us to put buses in places where we have those 90-minute delays or the double backs or circle backs. We are currently in a position where we have about 19 open routes. And so a reevaluating this system will allow us to restage and reorganize our resources so that all of our kids can have reliable transportation to and from school daily. Um, for our courtesy rides and our courtesy ridership program, under the new system, um, we absolutely are looking at our schools that have our, the highest needs for that courtesy ridership program. So we will still un honor and evaluate some of the courtesy rides based off of the needs of the community in our district. Um, and so our elementary schools um, will be evaluated for student transportation, how many students we have riding those buses and um, how many students are needed in the area. One of the challenges with courtesy is once you put a courtesy bus in an area and you have students utilizing that bus, if the bus fills up, then the first thing that we're going to have to do is add another bus because we can't pull the bus. So we will absolutely be strategic in what that evaluation and courtesy busing implement implementation system looks like for our um, schools that have those highest needs. Um, we will um, also PR and share with the parents a, our um, hazardous walking application 
which they will submit if their student feels that if they or their student feels that the walk is absolutely hazardous and dangerous, they will submit that. We will work to establish a committee to evaluate and review each of those applications. Um, once those applications are reviewed, the committee will make a decision based off the information that is presented forward. Um, that committee will consist of um, a community makeup of people in different respective places. Um, the information is detailed in um, state statute 1006.23 on how the makeup looks for that committee and what um, will be the evaluation criteria for that committee. Um, we will evaluate the request and we will follow up with the parents who are making the request with a decision on whether or not the, quest the request will be approved. If the request is approved for a specific stop location, then we will honor that stop location. So it won't necessarily be the request is approved for a specific student. It'll be more of a specific stop location. Any students in that location will be allowed to utilize that, that transportation based off of the stop being considered hazardous or that travel from that stop being considered hazardous. One of our next steps would be to establish that committee as we discussed earlier um, to evaluate our current system and our current um, school start times to ensure that we can have an efficient, effective three-tiered system to make sure that we maximize use of our resources. Um, we have every, 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 every notion to improve the current um, transportation operational efficiency for our community members and those of us who utilize school bus student transportation. We have provided a timeline for some of the topics that we have discussed today. Um, we um, have already took step one to notify our community and parents of the direction that we will be moving forward in the transportation department. Um, we currently are at step two, where we're bringing this before you guys so that we all can share um, what needs to be done and where we are in the process and, and how that's going to look as we navigate forward in the future. Um, step three will be our release of the um, hazardous walking survey, which we have already built and developed. Um, we will take this time between now and the next two weeks or so to establish that committee and put those applications forward so that we can start reviewing and evaluating for our parents in our areas who absolutely are hazardous so that that way we can have that hazardous transportation in place by the start of semester two. Um, our um, step five would be um, revise our current courtesy route. So to reflect, as we mentioned earlier, our elementary schools that absolutely have that highest need of, uh, and need the related services for student support, we will reevaluate, redraw, and rewrite those routes as a part of our optimization that we mentioned earlier. And we anticipate all changes to be effective and take place January 2024, um, whether it is the um, standard two mile um, students who will be affected by some of the changes, um, as well as our magnet and um, choice programs who will be affected by some of the changes, as well as courtesy. So um, we have a anticipated timeline and start date of January 2024, semester two for these changes. In between October and December, we are absolutely PRing the changes and making sure that our community has the necessary information to move forward as they will, in some cases, need to restructure um, based off of the transportation restructure. So we will communicate forward and put as much information out there as possible. We have every intention to over communicate. Um, with that being said and done, we thank you for your time and we will accept questions. Thank you, Dr. Rob. I have a couple. Does anyone else have any? Um, I'll start on this to my right. Dr. McNeil, do you have anything? Any questions? Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Ross, this um, presentation is excellent, very um, outlined quite well. Uh, I think you've hit a lot of the points that we talked individually about when we met one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, I do appreciate that. The timeline seems like it will work until we have citizens and parents who don't agree with us. We may have to have some extra time for um, discussion. I don't know um, how you plan to, I, I see how you plan to get the information to the parents, but when will they actually have time after they do the survey to come in and have a broader uh, opportunity to speak with you all and, and, and the department as far as the hazardous with what you're saying the state is going to be handling anyway, but sometimes um, it can be so broad that parents feel that it's still a necessity to uh, tailor um, the, the, the hazardous, because that's the one that I'm real concerned about as, real, as far as the courtesy, I understand um, the need to eliminate, but certainly the hazardous um, piece is going to be um, quite extensive and how people think and, and what's actually happening um, in those conditions. So um, I may have some other comments after we all have a chance to discuss but those were my points right now. Yes, ma'am. Um, Dr. McNeely, I think that that is a great question because half of this is absolutely subjective depending on who we are um, conversating and communicating with. The state sets forth some criteria that the state recommends that these are the things that you evaluate, these are the things that we consider, consider hazardous. Absolutely, as a district, we have the option to evaluate and say, well, based off of this and based off of the number of kids or based off of the number of kids that are using this travel way or based off of the high volume of traffic, we can look at that as a courtesy um, where we will not be funded for it, but we can look at it as a courtesy as a district um, issue. Yes, ma'am. So there are some ways to evaluate that, and I, and I think that at the end all be all, when those parents fill out the um, the survey to submit a application for request for review, I think the committee will be able to come together and say, okay, um, this may not necessarily be deemed hazardous, but based off of what we know about our community and how dangerous or how much vehicles are traveling on this travel path, we may want to look at this as a courtesy um, to continue transport. So absolutely, um, if the parent puts us on notice, it will be evaluated. And then to the, the three-tiered system for uh, starting schools, that's going to uh, be a high, I think, and high interest as well um, because of the nature of some parents having children at certain maybe all three levels, who knows. Um, but I, I think this is a great start, a, 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 a plan that could certainly be implemented um, as long as people feel that they've been heard and that we are watching and changing as to getting children safely to school and back home. That's the number one concern and certainly starting times where um, you can have, I think you said three different routes for one individual if you um, have this tiered system for st starting schools at those times. So I'm hoping that that will be sufficient and so that the calls that we receive will be eliminated. I think you've, you've outline things quite well. I appreciate you. Ms. Abbott, do you have any questions you want to say? I don't really have any questions, just a couple of statements. I'm super impressed by both of you, Ms. Eunice and Dr. Rawls. This is, you're new to this position and I feel like you've accomplished so much in such a short time. 
and transportation is something that's critical because we're not getting kids to school on time to learn then we're you know, spinning our wheels um, and you know I have two grandchildren in magnet programs that will be affected by this and both of their parents work but I think our our top priority is getting making sure that the kids go that are to their zone schools get there and then of course if we can provide for choice and magnet in a more efficient way such as you've outlined I think that's absolutely awesome also um, and then you know I think the big thing is I think there are some of those courtesy riders, especially I noticed that most of them are elementary children. And so it, there, there may be some hazardous um, stops that we need to have. And so I think the thing that's most important is just to make sure that we're promoting it so that parents are able to fill out the forms and, and you know, get their say in on that. But I... I love this, and I feel like it's going to save the district some money, which I'm sure Ms. Certain will like. And so um, thanks for, for, for all your hard work with that. Have you got the last one? Um, I concur with everything that my colleague Ms. Abbott just said. I am so incredibly appreciative to both of you. Dr. Rawls and Ms. Eunice, you have done a tremendous amount of work in a very short time. and. You know, I think it's really important that we as the board recognize you for that. Um, this presentation was fantastic. Our one-on-one -on -one meetings with you, at least mine was fantastic. Um, I really um, am hopeful that this will not just save some money, but also make sure that our children who need transportation are getting to school every day on time uh, and safely, and I think that as Ms. Abbott said, is our, is our number one goal. And right now we have children who are getting to school late. And so, you know, more than the financial savings, we need to make sure that operationally the students who require transportation are getting that transportation. Um, to me, this plan looks excellent. I really appreciate the detailed timeline so that we can know what to expect and when. And I'm just looking forward to the updates as we move along. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will say I'm so excited, you know, because this has been a thorn <laughs> in our side for so long. But you have. You've come in, Dr. Riles, and I knew with Ms. Eunice, uh, I look at food services. You did a great job with food services, and I knew when you got into operations, you would do the same thing. So uh, the one-on-one -on -one was great. Uh, you came with the solutions. And I appreciate that because when first one of the first things I said when we looked at transportation, courtesy, courtesy. I know what courtesy means, uh, but we really need to reevaluate those. And uh, because cheeks in the seats are what we like as school board members. Uh, the other thing is when we establish these committees, uh, I want to make sure we have people on there that's going to be fair uh, because we don't want to, you know, move from here we are making momentum. But then once you get into these committees, you know, we've had, you know, zoning committees in the past, so we want to make sure when we select these committees, these are going to be people who understand it's also about, also about cost saving, also making sure our routes, because I know if you're on Newberry Road, I know that's been a huge problem uh, with the, you know, with, tra with, tra with traffic. But what my concern is, please make sure we're fair with those committees, because we don't want to move from where we are now, because we're being proactive. And I like that in your in your uh, presentation, you're being proactive, but you also came up with great solutions. And again, the one-on-ones was was great. So thank you. Um, <coughs> so thank you all for that. I had a couple comments. So for these changes to be effective, um, Dr. Riles and Ms. Eunice, are, they're going to need board support, and we already can anticipate that once we try to change anything that parents are going to call and they're going or, or email us or call us individually um, they may email us collectively to the board members address and because they're not going to like the changes but our staff is going to need our support to go through with this so that we can we can make the needed changes um, what was not in the presentation, it, it was the percentages, and what I'd want folks to really be very clear on, and it's been outlined in past audit reports, 
FTE audit reports as well as our external audit reports is that the district receives, spends just o well over $11 million on transportation. And from the state of Florida, we're receiving just over $4 million. That's a $7 million gap that is coming out of the general fund. Those are funds that can't be used for anything. Now, the state of Florida will not reimburse 100% of our transportation costs. The goal is to try to move, as has been outlined in the presentation by them, to where the district is covering 50% of the transportation costs and the state is contributing 50%. If we can get, there are some districts around the state that, ha that are just over getting over 50% of reimbursement um, of their costs from the state of Florida, but that is because they have route optimization where their average bus occupancy is high, their util utilization is high, and they're not providing um, ridership to students who are not being reimbursed by the state of Florida. That is something we have to baseline and we have to really keep that uh, in, in mind, okay? Getting the students to school safely and on time is paramount. That is goal number one. They, they've led with that. I like their slogan, slogan that they're driving with that. And so um, for that, I am, I'm, I am I'm, I'm pleased with. I guess for me, um, if we have to come and they're competing interests, because we're going to get pushback, all right? So we have to give um, the support to them, as I said. But our first order or focus is to the students that the law says that we have to transport and those that are two miles um, uh, over, that live outside of the two miles. Um, and then the c courtesy riders and magnets, we're gonna have to decide because everyone is gonna want their courtesy. They're gonna want to continue to have that um, if it, it is deemed that it's not a hazardous walk, right? And so if they do the application, this, the committee that's set up, it's the makeup, um, Ms. McGraw, you said make sure it, it's fair. I, I agree with that, but the committee structure is, stat is by statute. And, and these people that are on here, that's not like a determination by our staff. We have to tell people that Florida statute 1006.23 outlines who, who are the representatives that are on this committee. And um, it's not that we, the board is choosing it or the district staff are choosing it, it's by here. So um, if they make that evaluation and we do the application and they do it, I'm sure that you know, some folks may say it's not. So we have to have a commitment that this is the, this is the pr path we're taking that we're going to go forward with that because there's only there we have to recognize that we're in a in a in a time where dollars have always been limited but now they're becoming even more limited so if we spend them and we make the investment in transportation of transporting students that are unfunded those are fewer dollars that we can use for something else and i think along with um, these considerations for transportation i think we look at adding programs at other schools that we can fund. So instead of putting the money in running buses that are only have a few students on them and they're not at full capacity, we invest those dollars into programs at schools so we don't have to transport students across the county is what I share with, um, with them in my one-on-one -on -one meeting and I think that we should look at. So I think we kind of as a board have to say if they start to get into this where there are competing interests between the magnet transporting and the courtesy ridership that is not deemed hazardous walking, which do we want them as staff to take um, to put more priority on in trying to meet the need of? Is it to continue to try to meet the needs of, or meet the requests um, that are sure to come for magnet students more magnet stops besides the one or two that you're proposing to move to? Or is it to try to extend ourselves to um, accommodate past courtesy riders that we, you know, riders that, um, or not past, but courtesy riders that may um, continue to be deemed that they're not um, hazardous walk and they're just riders that would be unfunded. And so I think as a, as a board, we need to let them know that because I think that is something that they may end up bumping up against between now and that January implementation date. That is one thing I had. Um, um, Dr. Rockwell, you look like you have something you want to say. Yes, I, I do have, um, I forgot that I had one question. Um, 
I didn't see in this plan one thing we talked about, which was seeking Medicaid reimbursement for students who are getting Medicaid reimbursable services at school. Do we have a plan for when we can implement that as well? We, a we absolutely have a plan for that um, and with our um, Medicaid consulting group civic solutions that we have here in Alachua County Public Schools it has been um, evaluated that they will do the billing and the reimbursement and so we will start the attendance process we will submit those and then if that student is Medicaid or uh, Medicaid has Medicaid and has a reimbursable ride we absolutely will receive those funds so um, yes, we are working with our um, civic solutions group that is um, supported by the district. Um, not necessarily a timeline. As soon as we get on board with them providing the attendance sheets, which are Scantron to our um, student ridership, we will immediately begin submitting those and they will immediately begin um, billing and coding for those students who are eligible. Okay, perfect. Thanks. I that wanted to go back because I see everybody keeps wanting to chill just to ask a question. As far as the committee and looking at the statutes, that or not looking at the statutes, it's the individuals who serve on that committee. Are they, what's the criteria if you could give? So there is a, um, we built a diagram. Hold on just a second. Dr. Rod, your mic isn't working. It doesn't sound like it. It's on, but I don't think it's working. Yeah. Let's see. All right. Okay. That's better. That's better. All right. Okay. Do I need um, Dr. Rockwell? Do I need to repeat about the? Um, uh, no, you can go ahead. I can't. We can still. Um, I'm sorry, um, Miss McGraw. So, um, could you repeat that question? She was asking about the committee makeup. Yes. So on the um, there's a um a structure chart in there that breaks down where the respective um, makeup and positions that will come. And so with the hazardous walking program. Once we determine that it is a um, hazardous walk, there are signatures from the community members, uh, municipalities and things like that, because if it is hazard, we have to evaluate it and put in a plan to correct that hazard, which is why that community, that which is why that committee is made up of those people in the respective places. Um, and so once we determine that, once the committee determines that it is hazardous, there are other respective um, you know, uh, county officials and city um, officials that will have to sign off on that report because what we are doing is saying, hey, that we, we acknowledge that this is an issue and then um, sitting down and developing, hey, what is a timeline, a scope of work or a plan of action to correct this hazard? So that's why it specifically outlines who. Yeah, those, the people on the, the district rep, and the state rep from that local municipality went along. Dr. McNeil, you said you had a question? Yes, I'd like to ask. Um, when colleague McGraw was speaking in terms of parents and citizens who would be involved, um, how much, because our employees who work for you and us um, are certainly the ambassadors um, for the department, and if they are in one accord, how many meetings have you had, um, if you can even say, um, with the staff, and I'm not meaning the leadership staff, I'm talking about your employees who drive the buses every single day. How many of them have been involved and are they in total agreement with the new plan? Because it's exceptional. But if the ambassadors don't see it as that, then we still have a problem. How, I mean, can you share? Um, yes, ma'am. Absolutely, um, Dr. McNeely, because um, one of my beliefs is that I do not have the ability to run an uh, organization of that size by myself. And so I will never, uh, never attempt that because I will probably lose. And so um, we have worked diligently with our drivers, our aides, because they are feeling the impacts and the pressures of this as well um, with not being able to get our students to and from on time or you know, going to drop off a group and then circling back to go get another group to make sure that those kids can get there on time or you know, talking about some of those traffic in infrastructure things or giving recommendations, you know, um, Dr. Riles, well, this bus is coming from that way. Maybe we can lessen the load or try to split this route. So they absolutely have been involved in that. I have 
sat down with some of our employees and drew out graphs and maps on um, you know, how we could do this more efficiently. Because the truth be told, the people out there doing the work have an insight that I wouldn't necessarily have. And so I've always been a collaborative leader to ensure that we meet the needs of all of the individuals, even those who are doing the work, because there's a portion of the infrastructure that they know that I'm not privy to because I'm not driving a bus every day. So um, when we talk about things like traffic and um, ways to go around and, 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 and what are those traffic peaks, because they're out there in those experiences. So absolutely, we have had our drivers and our aides um, as well as our um, administrative staff and supervi supervisory support staff in those conversations and in those meetings. Excellent. Uh, and this is really getting into the weeds of things. But um, with this plan, maybe you won't even need um, extra staff to communicate with the public. Um, I know that there have been some issues with calls coming in and not being heard or not being um, gotten back to. Uh, how are you planning to eliminate that? That's getting into the weeds of things and not tra actually transporting children, but it's still needed at in the system. So um, over over communicate, over deliver, and so one of the things with you know we um, our community says, well, hey, I didn't get a call back, or you know, you took two days to call me back, guys. It is absolutely because those are the people who are <laughs> out there trying to transport our children. And so um, if they have a CDL in, in our current position where we're short, you know, so many drivers and have so many open routes, the people who are supervisory or the people who should be returning those calls, absolute first responsibility is to ensure that our children are transported. And so once we can get them back in the office, there's a break in there, probably about three hours, that they can return calls, route students, and make sure that those administrative duties are done and then they're back out on a bus. And so if we can look at reducing or reorganizing our current resources with the restructure that we presented today, it will absolutely relieve those, those support staffs who will be returning those calls and getting back with the community and sharing what those changes and things are. So it will allow people to do their respective jobs. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Eunice, would you pull that mic? Um, Mr. Stanley, this, Sorry, this. I'm just going to, can you hear me? <laughs> I just want to make sure the community knows that we do have that contact sheet on the transportation website that if we didn't quite get their call or return it within an hour, if they fill out that contact sheet, we will return their call or email them within 24 hours. Wonderful. Okay. Um, I, I had another question. I was kind of asking you that. Um, the, have you all looked at, I know we've had like ma magnet buses, but were there students that live in an area and they attend a magnet and there's a regular bus there? Like are, are, are the students on magnet buses just totally separate or are, are they incorporated into a bus with children that live two miles over if they live in the same area? Um, they are incorporated if, okay. they, if they live in the same area. Typically what happens with that is that zone school will have a magnet program that that student is enrolled in at that zone school and they'll ride their zone bus. No, no that, that's good. But my question was, is so say if I live in a community and um, a bus come, it, is picking up students to take them to another school, but it could be on the way to my magnet school? Absolutely. So um, we do a lot of that with our east side in Lofton. And um, we do a lot of that I inclusively. So we'll have a route that is running a regular zone school, and then its next tier may be magnet, depending on where it's going. Okay, and so they're incorporated in. It's not to sort of kind of like fill that bus up, and it's not just another bus that's picking up those few magnet students is what I was asking. Yes, yes, ma'am, they are incorporated in. And, and there are some cases where they are not, which is like our long hauls, because there's nothing you can do with time and distance again. Thank you. Um, Ms. Edel, you have a question? Um, so I think for this plan to work, that it has to be implemented with fidelity, meaning like this is the plan we're going with and there's no variation or deviation from it. And so because if you have something, a program that's working really well, then you can afford to add on 
stuff. So when, when we have the transportation department getting all of our zone kids to their schools on time, then we can work on maybe enhancing choice and courtesy and all of that. But I think if we start this and we're making exceptions and saying, okay, well, we'll add another hub for magnet schools, then in addition to putting more work on you guys, we're just kind of, again, not doing what we said we were going to do and sticking to the plan. And so I think that's really important that whatever we decide to do, that we stick to that plan. And we have a, a committee that's an unbiased committee that's going to look at the hazardous uh, walking and make decisions based on that, as Ms. Burton said. And so it's not like it falls back on any of the staff or us. Those That was made by an independent committee. And so I, and it, and I, it, it is hard to tell parents no, and there are going to be parents, many parents, who are going to um, protest about it, but I think we have to stand firm and say when we get our program running well, we'll look at it possibly adding more, more to it. I, I agree with that. Ms. Certain asked, you know, what, what wiggle room would we prioritize? And I wouldn't prioritize wiggle room. You know, I think you and, you and other staff members are going to make decisions about which schools are the highest need elementary schools where you're planning already to keep a couple of courtesy routes for that. And then beyond that, you're looking at a hazardous walk conditions committee. And we're looking at one to two hub stops per zone school per magnet, which probably depends on the size of that zone. Um, and, you know, keeping kids within, I guess, two miles of their hub spot. Um, but but I, I agree with Ms. Abbott, we can't have wiggle room, we have to stand strong. Yes, people are going to be upset and, and I understand that, but we, again, we're going to have to be very consistent with our messaging that our goal is to get our students who we are required to transport to school on time every day and until we're doing that, we cannot offer extras. Thank you, Dr. Rockwell and Ms. Abbott. I think we, you, you all are, I, I, I'm not sure if you understood what I was saying. I, my message was to us yeah. in that I, I believe, I, I agree with what you just said, but to us, because the appeal is gonna come to us the appeal is going to come to the board members, right? The, the, the appeal is going to come to the board members, and then we're, we, board members, will then be reaching out to the staff and saying this parent and wanting to get that done. And when board members reach out to transportation and want them to add these stops, they're going to feel that we're leaning in and wanting them to do that versus us going through the criteria. So they're going to need our support of what the plan they put forth is what my point was. We don't need the wiggle room, but I'm saying if they have to, and then once they go through all of this process here and th they have some competing interests of things that they're trying to accommodate, they need to know from us what we want to prioritize. Not wiggle room in their plan. Like if they have to prioritize or they have resources, are we going to say that we're gonna continue to provide um, or increase the magnet stops? We're, we're saying we're only gonna have one to two magnet stop or hubs we have to lean into that and, and, and stick to that. I'm not saying you can't get off any of it, but we, we have to, our first priority, as I have been saying for years, has to be to those students that the state requires us to transport. And we haven't done that. We haven't been really doing that very well. And then anything else is ancillary and we do it on our, how we can, as the resources are available and that we can, can accommodate them. So. It seems that you, you've, um, are, are, you've presented a very uh, robust plan, very good work. I want to echo what my colleagues have said. You've done good work in a short period of time, given us a timeline of where you're really trying to get out and to get things done um, and not just promises that you're going to do it. And I appreciate that. And um, so just um, go ahead, Dr. McNeely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mrs. Eunice and Dr. Rawls, how closely are you all working with the rezoning group because that's going to impact quite a bit of your plan, of planning, and I'm just wondering what's happening with that. So we are working very closely with the rezoning group. We actually had a meeting with um, Ms. Martha 
um, about two weeks ago. We have some conversations planned ahead centered around costs and students that will be removed and what the new walk zones are going to look like with um, Dr. Edwards and Ms. Martha. So absolutely, we are tag teaming this and, and paralleling, paralleling forward together. So uh, will your plan not, thank you for answering that. Will your plan that you are going to be implementing in June be based on what now? T t how are you actually starting that plan come January 2024? Yes, and so we will take the next couple of months to, to redo our infrastructure, and that plan will absolutely roll forward in January 24. I agree with everything my colleagues have said, and uh, basically we need to stay out of it. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need when they call. Uh, but one of the things I want to ask while I have you all here, um, and you may have to work on this later, but you know I'm big on behavior. And so when behaviors are happening on this bus, on your bus, we, we got to make sure bus drivers, when they are dealing with certain behaviors, you know, we can't keep just, you know, saying don't do that or giving a child. The way we change behavior is through consistency. And I've already gotten several phone calls this year that said I'll give you the bus numbers. That's what made me think about it when Dr. McNeil asked her question. Um, we we got to learn to write them up because what happens is it's not, not just about when you, when you do the referral and it goes to the proper place, now we can begin to say if there's some serious behavior issues where kids are being bullied on the bus, we can uh, begin to address that and bring in the family because if we make move toward, I'm big on moving toward truancy, to bring that pa parent in to have a conversation. But when it comes to the bus, parents are already complaining. And so we, we want to look at that because if the bus driver is not doing the referral, that child, that behavior does not change of that student who's continuing to cause the problems on the bus and kid, other kids are just so afraid to ride the bus because they're being bullied. So I, I, we, we gotta work on that too. Let me give it to you. Okay. So before we go forward, I'm gonna call, there's, I see several citizens in the audience. If there is some citizen input, um, you, you don't have to do a form if you don't want Dr. Kessman. You can, um, we'll receive that right now. I don't know, is there a mic there? Okay. Yes. Hi. Thank you, everybody. Good Chair morning. Certain, board members, Superintendent Andrew, everybody else. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tessman from ACEA. Um, I absolutely see the importance of, of writing referrals. Um, in, in my experience this year, um, it seems like our drivers are often writing referrals. Um, the concern is what happens after the referral is written also, um, but I mean, there's always Yes, we need to document, document, um, but we, it's not an easy, easy problem to tackle of how to get a child to school who cannot safely ride a bus until their behavior has changed, but we need to look at that. Um, I know there are laws, you know, cannot transport unless you're in a bus, unless it's an emergency, X, Y, Z. But um, I'm hoping that maybe if we look at the legal side of it, if somebody is, you know, being violent on a bus, um, they, they need help. We need to make sure they get what they need. But it's not safe to the whole bus, to the, to the roadways, to the driver, to have them fighting or that kind of thing while the bus is in motion. So if that means that a principal or um, a resource officer or – a district official needs to help that child get to school if that's something we can legally do to make it safe and still have the child get to school, get the resources that they need. Um, I think that's something we need to look into. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tessman. Um, anyone else? Any other citizen input? Could you please give us your name? You have three minutes to cover that. Mr. Brackey, I'm sorry. Would you please lift the mic up? Um, Okay. There we go. Uh, I'm Ted DeBracke. Uh, three quick points. One is on the um, 
change from courtesy busing to the hazardous routes. Um, it probably really isn't that difficult to define what the hazardous routes are. That's a fairly mechanical process. And one aid might even be the drivers, that the bus drivers will know what, what their routes are and what, which ones are walkable or not. As far as the finances for that, I think Dr. Rolls said there was about $12 million spent on busing in the district and about one-sixth of the busing was for courtesy students. So, that, so that's about two million in round numbers. If that was all defined as hazardous, as a, uh, as a uh, ceiling, you'll probably uh, get about a million dollars more revenue from the state if, if they match that. I mean, maybe it's only gonna be half of that, but that's generally a ballpark number. Uh, Second thing was on the triple tier system. Um, I mean, that really affects a lot more than busing. I mean, it really affects the entire community, not only the 7,000 students ballpark that you're transporting, but the whole 28,000 ballpark in, in the district. Um, when I lived in Indiana, the superintendent of a school district there wanted to switch the starting times of high school from being the first ones to open to the later ones that open. And people were complaining about that. I mean, basically, it completely would change the way the whole community would function as far as kids' jobs, uh, childcare, sports, and everything like that. So it's a lot more profound than just what, what happens to busing. Uh, he also mentioned uh, the 70 minute uh, time difference between each, each route for each bus. Uh, in, in a place where I went to high school a long time ago, currently they do have triple tier, but the high school starts at 715 and some of the elementary schools start at 925. So that's a pretty drastic change. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was the magnet school stops for the, the, uh, the hub stops. I think that's a good idea in Pennsylvania, where I was a school board member, um, school districts are required to transport every single private school student as long as they're within 10 miles of, the, of where the boundary of the school district is. And one of the solutions they came up with is to basically, if you went to, I'm gonna say the Catholic school that was on the other side of the county, uh, your child had to walk, if they were a walker ordinarily, they had to walk to their home school if it was within two miles. And then they would be picked up just from that one place to go to the private school. So that might be a solution to help out with uh, you know, the, uh, the hub stops for the uh, uh, magnet schools. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gervasi. Um, Dr. Rawls, could you tell us um, the for HB, the school start time is HB 7033, um, the proposed times of what it says that the high school, like when we can start, because the, that statute is gonna kind of outline, outline the earliest that, a, that we could start school by two. Can you tell us that? So um, <clears throat> 733 says that um, high schools can begin no earlier than 8 a.m. and our middle schools can begin no earlier than 8 30 a.m. Starting, Starting July 2026. So we right, have 2026, right. And, but there's, and elementary is not in there, correct? Elementary will not be impacted. Okay. Um, yeah. So <laughs> right now, currently, our middle start is at 920, most of them? 915, 915 920, 15, something 9, like that? 15, yeah. yeah. And high schools are starting when? 830-ish, um, 835. And then middle, and elementary is 745, correct? Or somewhere in there, right? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. 745. 745, 750, depending on location. And we had a couple, I know when we met, there were a couple of schools, like was it High Springs Community School? Because they have middle schoolers there but are running elementary hours, that would have to change based on the law, regardless of the transportation plan. Yes. Correct? And there might have been a center school as well, I can't remember. Hawthorne, I think. Yeah. Hawthorne, Hawthorne High and Middle, um, Mabane, and then High Springs were the three that 
would not be in a line um, with the HB 733. Gotcha. Madam Chair, I have a caller. Uh, go ahead, put them forth, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, caller. You have three minutes with the board. Please state your name. Caller? Is there any other public input in the, in the room? And I, um, and I may not have said this backwards, and I may have, but I just want to put it on the record. It is 8 a.m. for middle schools and 8.30 for high schools. Ah, okay. I, may have I think you reversed crossed it. You transposed it. Okay. Oh, excuse me. That's okay. So 8.30 for high school. Yes, ma'am. And then for middle yes. is what? So no earlier than 8 a.m. and then no earlier than 8.30 a.m. for our high schools. Sorry for, for that. No, no, that's okay. Looks like we're already, we don't have to do any changing for high school now um, on, on middle. I mean, I, Unless I'm missing something, I think the three that you changed, that you mentioned, High Springs, Hawthorne, and Mabane, are not in alignment with what the statute would say, would um, would require rather. Um, okay, so I I'm going to ask you, you have you do you have um, you've brought to the board um, what you're proposing to do, what you'd like our support on, and I think you've gotten that. Do, is there anything else that you need from us as a board to move forward with where? with the direction that you're recommending? At this time, we do not need um, any additional support. If we do, we will absolutely reach out as we move forward with the plan. And in January um, 24, you in the presentation, you mentioned some reconfiguring of the routes. So we can expect the, the routes to be currently as they are, um, and, but you're going to be looking at probably re rerouting those to fill the buses up a little bit more. It's not just the, the courtesy and the magnet hubs. It would also be some rerouting as well, correct? Changing of the routes, correct? That, that's correct because in the process of the restructuring, we will be able to delete some routes, so there will be some restructuring, but we will um, keep stops as closely as possible as planned to what they are now. That's going to be interesting. For our two-mile in special needs. <laughs> it's uh, it's going it's going when you say like you keeping them cuz they may change is what I'm just I'm thinking they, they there's likely it's highly likely that your st stops are going to change or routes could change we could have cuz you're trying to fill the buses up. Absolutely. Right? And so when we talk about the change the the stop is vetted as a stop. So the stop may remain the same but when we talk about change and condensing the times may change. Mm -hmm. So it may be a little bit earlier, it may be a little bit later. Um, so those are some of the changes that we will see as it relates to our students who are um, greater than two miles and our ESC students. Um, we may absolutely see a, a time change, but not necessarily stop location. Um, and then for our courtesy and hazard and magnet and choice programs, we may see stop changes as well as time changes. Well, thank you all for your work on this. I know um, you jump in really quickly. Both of you all new to your spots and done that. So we appreciate your work that you have. I'll review this a little bit more, and I may have questions. The a supplemental information that you guys gave to us last night, um, I didn't didn't get to it before this morning. So, I, but I may have some some questions on that. And thank you all for that. I'm just yeah. Madam Chair. If I may, uh, just to clarify times, because you've talked about times back and forth, so to clarify for our public, um, pickup times may change in January, but s school start time will remain the same. Thank you, Superintendent. So just so no one mishears that. Yes, thank you. Not changing our elementary, middle, and high school start times in January, and I know that's that's not what you said, but I just want to clarify because we talked about a lot of different times, but we're staying the course with our official start times as they are published at this time. And what we're looking at is the routing and stops could remain the same when your child is expected to be there. All those things, some adjustments could come. Thank of course, the hubs and everything else, but I just want to be sure the public understood that, correct? 
Thank you. Yeah, that is correct. Thank you for that clarity. And then with your um, with your reorganization restructure, I mean, there's some subtle stuff there uh, that we've been discussing that should support your team and the work they do with communication. And I think you you said it as um, do their respective jobs and therefore provide better service to to our uh, families. And so uh, we know you're doing that as well. And we just want to thank you, the department. Uh, some of your teammates that are here today for all of your work. We appreciate y'all. Thank you, Superintendent. All right, I don't have anything else. If you guys are. Well, done. I thank you guys. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I've been asked if we could recess for about 10 minutes uh, shortly, so we're going to take a little short break till 10:20 if we, if we can get them back in, okay?
something about our calendars. I'm gonna um once we put this platform. It is that type of time of year. I think committee weeks are starting um, now <laughs> up there um, in Tallahassee. And um, each year we normally, um, the board develops a legislative platform whereby we use to um, speak with our local delegation and as well as we speak with the delegation, um, our local delegation when we go up to Tallahassee for the um, school board, uh, Florida School Board Association. Um, legislative days um, and we're hoping that um, they'll have a local act a local legislative meeting also at Santa Fe we usually share that but it's something that we try to agree upon as a district with the hope also that it aligns with what our state association has they have not developed the state association just so you all know has not developed its platform yet we're having um, there's a meeting on Thursday at 10 I think 10 o'clock on third 10 o'clock a.m. on Thursday, there's a Zoom, and the call has gone out. If you saw the FSBA newsletter that comes out each Wednesday where they've been asking for submissions um, or suggestions from, from our, the membership around um, uh, platform ideas that would then be, can be you know, consolidated and considered, and the association will vote on uh, the FSBA platform on October 6th. I think that's Friday when they're, when they're here at our board of directors meeting. But I think the window is still open if you all want to contribute anything to that platform. But today, um, we're here to work on our Alachua counties. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jackie now. And your, your mic. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, as um, Ms. Certain said, uh, the committee and subcommittee meetings have already started this week. Uh, the legislative session officially doesn't start until March 11th um, in 2024. Uh, and also, as Ms. Certain said, FSBA does not yet have uh, its platform according to their timeline on their website. Uh, it looks like December 1st is about the earliest there will be something sort of formalized that during the joint meeting, uh, during the, the state meeting? No, th we'll actually have something we should have a, when we come out of our October 6th meeting that, that'll oh, be good. here. Okay. We should have, a, it may not be totally, totally done, but we'll vote on, the board of directors will vote on the submissions from the members oh, in that meeting. I, whatever that Friday is, I need to look at my calendar. I think it's October 6th. Yes, it is. That's yeah. coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Well, so we'll start. We'll start. We, they'll be in on Tuesday evening and Wednesday, but we have our board of directors meeting Friday morning. So we'll have something when we come out of that. Um, it should be. It may not be wordsmith, but we'll have have some items when we come okay. out of that meeting. Okay. Uh, last year, as you know, uh, our legislative program mirrored FSBA's, uh, and um, so you all have a copy of that, and then. Uh, Mr. Brooks provided me with uh, those items that I emailed to you, those three additional items that FISBIT has requested that their member districts include uh, on their legis uh, legislative platforms this year. So um, we were asked to, to, to place this item on today's agenda. So at this point, I wasn't sure whether it was the board's pleasure to try to build something from scratch, whether they want, to, whether you want to suggest items uh, to perhaps send to FSBA as recommendations and then whatever we do again mirrors FSBA or sort of mirrors FSBA with some additional items from the board. So uh, really I'm, I'm looking for board direction on how you want to proceed. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. You, um, so for me, do you all have any, any suggestions? Having read what, what the 23 platform was, do you all have any suggestions, things that we'd like to carry forward, things we'd like to strike off, or um, any new additions? We don't have to keep carry this forward. I do, I, I will say the FISBIT items, the insurance items, because that is such a challenge for um, our district, I do think we should add those in. Um, 
the thir there, there will likely be 13 districts, those of us that are part of the insurance trust, that are part of in FISBIT, we will likely, they will likely have these um, three items on here because insurance, honestly, it is a, a huge tra challenge for us, the especially the property lines. Um, so I, I'm, I would, my, my vote would be so that we do include these three things with whatever we have. So does anyone else have anything? I'll, I'll share my other thoughts as well um, later, but or I can share them now. I think the mental health one I'd like to keep. Uh, both bullets and the mental health? Um, we'll have to change it a little bit because it has Hurricane Ian in there, but I do think um, at, at least one of them increase um, um, mental health allocation and um, I, the safe school one as well. I think we, I think both of them, yeah, but we just have to have to word it a little bit different because of the Hurricane Ian thing that's in there. Um, I, I like the CTE one and I do think that is one, I, well, not do think, I, I recall that being a submission by several districts also of uh, increased workforce development funding. Um, I've gotten a spreadsheet of the suggestions for members and that's there. I, so we wouldn't really be out of line with that CTE, the funding one, as well as the adjunct teacher, the one about the teachers. Okay, so that would be the first and the third mm -hmm. bullet? Yep. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen some, some things around the um, temporary certification. Yeah, that was. Um, so we, we could drop that off since that's been passed. Um, the funding for the teacher salary allocation, that needs to, we need continuing funding. I don't know how we would say that, but they need to continue to support that as well as the staffing funding. You know, we, the $15 minimum, we had we met that last year, but we need um, um, funding to, su su to support that as well as increase that. The um, reemployment, I think that's been changed. That was modified in last session, so I think we can drop that one. The eliminate barriers for reemployment for high quality personnel um, after they've retired under FRS. I think that one was adopted last year. It was, um, they've already made some change in that. And this last one about. Um, instructional personnel to include pre-K. I'm not sure if that was handled last year um, in session and if that's something we wanna continue to hold on, we can we can keep it and see how it falls. We can check on that. Yep. And on the funding, I think we can eliminate the first one there because that was EN related. But maybe the FISBIT recommendation about the first 25 million due to any hurricane could replace it because it's related. Would that be more? Um, or maybe we, we have a section just for insurance. Okay. Since those three are kind of there, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't, we could do it there or we could just keep them kind of separate. Increase the B BSA. Do we want to leave the five percent in there, or do we want to um, just say increase that? I don't know if we want to ask for a specific amount. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And in the second one, the integrity of categorical funds, that's gone. Like almost all the categorical funds have been rolled in. So if we wanted to keep that, we need to scratch that line. Uh, oh, the third one, yeah, that's gone. Yeah. Without increase, transparency, okay. I'd like to keep the one about summer and after school learning opportunities. Let's see, I think we had that um, that set aside under ESSER last year, but I don't know. I think it's two summers, if I'm not mistaken. Is that two summers, Joel, for ESSER? 
the summer school program, and I know last summer we had a pot of money. Could you, would you turn your mic on? You I know last summer, I'm not sure about two summers ago. No, so it wasn't for two summers, it wasn't last summer and this summer coming up. We will have it for this summer as well, yes. But this coming. For the 2023, 2024. 20, summer yes. is, okay. Yes. Um, so I don't know if that one's applicable then, the increased funding for, you know, for the mm. summer, since we have that pot of ESSA money is what I'm saying. I, I think we probably dropped that one. Um, I think we keep that one. I think we keep the transportation one. Um, the cybersecurity one, I think we we keep that. Uh, we'll see, and, and maybe we keep see how this, this shakes out in FSBA because it was a big thing last year because of the increase in insurance rates around um, the cybersecurity and stuff. And so it's probably still an issue. I don't know if they'll keep it on the FSBA platform. So maybe we wait and see on Friday, I mean, in two weeks, how that shakes out, if we, could, if we all okay with that. And this, the last one there that revised the per cost per student station cap, I think we need to keep that one. Suzanne, are you, uh, Ms. Wynn? Some of that happened? The per student cap for construction? Didn't they make some sort of an adjustment last year? Sure, the cost per student uh, caps on construction, uh, didn't they make some adjustment last year to increase it? Oh, okay, well we can drop yeah. that then. I thought, okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. I knew it came up last year, but I wasn't sure what it, if it was. So, I'm sorry, Ms. Wynn. Would you come to a mic? Would you, so only because we're recording and folks won't be able to hear you and I'll, well. They did suspend the, the cost per student station requirement for a period of time, for a p period of years. Um, and it's, it's quite a long time, but I don't have the exact year. So uh, for our projects for Westwood and Littlewood, they will not be in, in effect. Okay, okay. So we, we can drop that one then, I think, from, the, from, the, from our, um, uh, our platform. Okay, so we have the impact of HB1 um, on there. Do we want to add anything on there about transparency for um, asking for more transparency or the same requirements for the private schools and all of that accountability standards that we're having with different schools have? Anyone have any suggestions on that? Madam Chair, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, so on HB1, uh, just you're right on point there that we do need them to level the playing field and if we call it deregulation that's some of what we've talked about mm -hmm. um, but since vouchers can go to all schools I believe it's prudent for us to care about where the money is spent and how students and children perform at all schools private schools charter schools everywhere so I think that should definitely be a legitimate um, concern of ours and then in, in that leveling of the playing field, I think they should review the required instruction statutes because as we feel, if we're using public dollars, it, it should be accountability and um, within the whole system, measuring of the right things, you know, let's measure all, let's hold everyone accountable since they're public dollars and let's revisit what is required. Um, because along with that, as you all know, mm -hmm. charter school dollars pass through us, but we don't have uh, oversight of their their opening their operations and things like that also uh, I think we should request along those lines with with HB1 is just um, a rollback of rulemaking I believe there's 73 there's 70 plus rules up for review in October of 2023 and you know I, I believe we should push for there's too many rules and there's not enough interpretation of said rules so it's challenging because if we don't get interpretation of the laws or the rules, then we're to implement them without guidance or um, clear direction, right, from the state level. So I believe that's something that we really want to push for is there's just, and as we all know, there's amendment changes all along the way to mm -hmm. the rules. 
And so that whole process it just really complicates what we're doing. So just that kind of deregulation for all, because I doubt the legislature really wants to apply these same rules and regs and accountability and requirements to the private and charter schools. So then lessen those on us and, and let's have that approach, you know, pull them away from us if they're not accountable for assessments and it rela related to performance, graduation, things like that. So I believe all along those lines and you can take that a lot of different areas within our system. So that's just my <laughs> suggestions on that piece of HB1 and the, then the whole rulemaking process. I, I'm gonna chime in. I'm very sensitive about charter schools and I just want to say that a charter school is a public school and they're held to the same standards as, as any other public school. And there are oversights by the district. Um, we, all of our teacher certification goes through the district. Um, we're monitored by the district and every, every department monitors every department within the charter schools annually. And we are required, depending on if you're a high performing school or not, to turn in financials monthly or quarterly. And so unless there's some new legislation coming through that takes charter schools out of that, they are held accountable the same way that other traditional public schools are. And you're correct, there's a lot more accountability there following those dollars than the ones the private schools, so private everything's not schools. exactly the same. Um, yeah, the private and the, the homeschool dollars, the PEP. I think um, yeah. also we need uh, some guidance. I don't know if we want this in our platform or not, but the guidance on the uh, the personal education plan, PEP, is that the, is that the title of it, PEP, personal education plan, for the homeschools and coming in and how, um, how, how, that, how that's yeah. done. I, I have concerns with that too because homeschooled students are being given a sum of money that is supposed to be used for the student's education and the administration of that funding has been given to private organizations. So the state is not administering it. Step up for students and I forget the name of the other one. There's three now. <laughs> this one now. There, there, there are three organizations. One organization just provides uh, support for private schools. So we have step up for students and then AAA. Okay, okay. I was talking about the so homeschools. So there's still two for homeschools? Correct. Okay. So, but those organizations are deciding what are allowable expenses, not the state. And I think that's a problem because some of the allowable expenses are a flat screen TV up to 55 inches. Um, which yes, you might, the district funds television and other media purchases for a classroom, but that's a classroom that's serving 20 plus students for multiple years with that same equipment, not one or two or three children in a home. Um, it's also an allowable expense to buy backyard playground equipment and to buy theme park tickets, which yes, we sometimes take children on field trips to somewhere like SeaWorld and it has an educational component, but we don't use general fund state dollars to fund those. And so if we are not using general fund dollars to fund trips to theme parks, I don't think private school students should be either. And I don't know that we can say in our platform what we want allowed and not allowed, but I think the state, but it, it seems like the state should be setting the rules for what's an allowable expense, not the organization that administers it because the organi organization that administers it <coughs> Ha, they get paid to administer each scholarship and so they have a vested interest in attracting more scholarship students. And the parents get to choose whether AAA or Step Up administers, the parent gets to choose which one. So both of those organizations are competing to say we will cover more and better things so that they will get that funding for the scholarships. And if there was a uniform state mandated this is what is an educational expense and this is not, I think that would be much more fair. I agree. I agree with what you're saying, but I don't want to put it part of the platform. 
I think let us. I think let's let's look. Um, there is a deregulation subcommittee. I think it's part of legislative, and they're going to kind of address that because it has been talked. I just don't know how. I don't know how how um, beneficial it's going to be to have it part of our platform. You know that grandeur. It's kind of like we, um, we were for years. We had on there moved the 1.5 mil back to two mil, and it was just. A we just, it was just there, it didn't, you know, it was like, they kept saying, you keep asking for that and you haven't gotten it yet, so it was, so I don't know if it'll be beneficial. I'm not saying we don't, it's not an issue. I just don't know if it'll be beneficial to have it as part of our platform. And I think maybe um, if, if it is something that is being discussed and maybe we discuss it with the association and that be one of those dereg items that we kind of like have Bray Robinson with FSBA or even um, Rutledge and Cena you know, the, the agency that, uh, that advocates for us, that that's something we pass along to them that they can communicate because I think putting it as part of the platform may just be a little too, you know, we, we kind of like, we, we want things that we may have some success in getting because some of these things we did that were on our platform, our district as well as the FSBA, we ha were kind of successful in getting and maybe those things, it's important, but I don't know if it's, we should put it here. The good point though, I agree with you. The, I, I want to add into that, I think the time that our zoning and those office that they use um, processing these applications, the, the, the step up, because some of that stuff, if, if I'm not mistaken, runs through zoning, the applications to the, the scholarship folks, them either leaving the system or coming back to the school district. And I, um, I think we, if that is happening, we need to keep up with that time because we're not, we don't get that 3%, the district doesn't. We lose the funding, but the time, the administrative time that um, our zoning and the, that office that they're using, um, we, we really need to just keep up with that. I mean, even the time when we, if we have homeschoolers wanting to come in and we're gonna have to figure out how to price out um, classes that um, the PEP holders will have. Um, because I think if districts are kind of like saying, we're not a preferred provider, kind of, because we're not, we, we weren't situated to do that this year. I think the legislator, legislature and the, and the Board of Education will come in with a, a hammer um, and say, okay, this is what you're gonna do and they'll set it. So we kinda gotta get to the point where we figure out what our, um, how we're gonna cost out the, the service to deliver that. But I don't know if putting it on here, it's one of those d issues. <coughs> I don't know if putting it on part as a part of the platform. So we have any other suggestions uh, outside of these right here that we would like to to see added on here. And I think for me, I think those three items for the FISBIT recommendation, maybe there's like a separate subcategory, kind of how we have like the um, mental health workforce, personal recruitment and retention and funding, and then that it could be something with insurance or something like that, I don't know. I can do that. Yeah. Um, what we could do is wait and see what FSBA comes up with with the SIT, after the SIT. Um, Ms. Certain, you and I can talk a little bit more about what's on there that may not be on what you all have talked about today. Uh, I can then flesh out something, send to you, and we could put it on the October 17th okay. board meeting for approval, unless you feel that's too soon, then do we want to bump it to November? Uh, Let's target the 17th. And then what I could do is I can share with you the, the output from the, the six. It may be rough, but you can do wordsmith and wherever they, you right. know, because that's what will probably be left. I can okay. I think Dr. McDougall will probably say, let me work on it after that meeting. And But I can give you the topics that they have, and we can work them in, and then we could fill, you could circulate them with, to us right. like you've done this stuff here. Right. And um, we can come to something, and hopefully by the 17th. And if we need to, to push it out, we could, we could move it from the 17th, but we can have that as okay. our target. Okay. Yeah, we don't th we don't go through rulemaking for that one, so it's mm -mm. Okay. And you all feel free if you if there's something else that you when you leave here uh, that you all think is important that needs to be part of this, please um, email. You can email um, Ms. Johnson so that she'll know. And I guess we will ask. Uh, um, our staff, if they have anything that they think is pertinent that they want us to be advocating for as part of this process that we haven't thought of, you know, that wasn't part of our, our platform last year and, and hasn't been part of the, the discussion that we've had this morning. Is there anything else that you all want to chime in and add? I do want to, are you okay with me sort of wordsmithing some of what um, 
Mr. Andrew talked about as far as uh, HB1? Um, um, I am. Why don't you do that and and we hold it and then we can compare it to what comes out of the six also? Because I, like I said, I do know that there is they there have been some people that have been me meeting with that <laughs> with all the issues because folks are the same issue that we discussed here today. Your HB one could be its own page. It could be its own page. Yeah, yeah. So j and and honestly, the, the guidance that we I don't say the guidance, but the suggestion that we've been given is it's here. So don't say like roll it back. But if it is a leveling of the playing field is what we've been encouraged to ask for, the things that we've been encouraged to ask well, for. Well, and also I think it's a good point that the uh, we would appreciate clear and consistent guidelines for a lot of this because I know that has been an issue is uh, lack of clarity on what some of those <laughs> rules are, right. what we can and can't do under those rules. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases we... In a lot of cases, we get absolutely no guidance no, nothing, yeah. at all. I mean, I have a question with that because when we're asking for clarity on rules and interpretations of rules and fewer rules, that's a Board of Education request, not a legislative request. Does that, do we still want that on here? Um, I mean, we, I'm not saying it would be. I'm, yeah. I'm not, I don't, I don't I'm think just we, asking. I don't think um, the, well, so the Board of Education does take and make the rules based on what the legislative, and I, I think you're right in that we wouldn't want that there. I think we keep it with the deregulation piece and how that, like how the rulemaking is gonna come out. You know, I do know that Gray Robinson is talking on that along that line, and I know um, Andrea McKenna, when she's meeting with DOE staff is trying to say, look, you know, our numbers are challenged because we don't have guidance from you guys. And this is, you know, she's trying to run. I do know that's a conversation, but it's, uh, you're right as far as probably having it in here is not a good idea because the legislature, they don't do the rulemaking that is Board of Education. So, but those conversations, I think it is something that we, we have a note. We may have a second sheet just kind of for us um, with more detail, but that is something that those are conversations we could have because the Board of Education is influenced by these people. So we just want that in there. Madam Chair, yes. I have a thought. I wonder about legislation related to class size amendment and thinking about the ways in which we can look at those numbers when we have both a highly qualified teacher and a highly qualified para pro in the classroom. Uh, or, or and, a highly qualified teacher and perhaps an individual who is in a pre-service education program. That might help us with some of the shortages that we have in classrooms. If we can add a few additional children as long as we have an additional highly qualified adult in there with them. Okay. So I guess maybe you and Jackie can work on kind of wording that and then sharing it with us. Um, um, yeah, especially since they're eliminating the funding for it and not the requirement for that we meet it. So. Well, and I think it might also be in line with the, the work that they're looking at right now where we have, um, where colleges of education are working with local school districts to on the para to pro pathway mm -hmm. and having those individuals in that pipeline be in classrooms with mentor teachers, highly qualified mentor teachers for an extended period of time. So it might nicely align with work that they've already considered or is valuable to be done. Yeah, that's good. And that may actually end up get some, get some bite when we're already in the language there. And so, yeah, so maybe you and Jackie work on something, something concise to do that. Okay, anything else? You all don't have anything on this one? Okay. All right, I don't have anything else. Did you, anyone else have anything else? You all have anything else? Okay. Um, do we have any citizen input? Put anyone in the auditorium, any citizen input here? Okay. Uh, Ms. Eunice, do you have anything? I there were one of these things here does involve transportation with moving the, taking the vehicles out of the commercial pool so we don't have that um, stacked PIP thing. Is there anything else that transportation related?
Yeah. Um, so there, there's nothing on food service, but I will tell you I am going to D.C. next week, and that is one major point of making free meals for all students, um, irregardless of income, making that permanent, reinstituting that, and that is like the one of the top funding things, that and, and more funding for IDEA. But, mm. so but fun. those are federal, not federal, state. Right, yeah, yeah. So that is on the federal platform, and that, that is one item. I, I'll um, see if I can download it and I can share it with you, okay, so you can see it. All right. All right. So if that's it, we are adjourned. Thank you all, and we'll, we'll be in touch. So you you guys can could stop the um, video in the booth. Yeah.